Hello again everybody. Now that we have a reasonable handle of uh, elastic waves and lattice waves and phonons, we are going to move on to the electron. We now know that electrons have wave-like nature, but this was not known um, over a hundred years ago. So we are going to treat the electron uh, classically and we are going to treat the electron as a very simple uh, particle. Uh, that bounces around in our solid. In fact, our first uh, stop would be uh, the behavior of electrons and metals. And we are going to use uh, a very simplified view um, of how electrons behave in metals. In fact, what we are going to do is we are going to use the uh, ideas presented by Paul Ruder uh, in 1900 and soon after that by uh, Lorentz. So this theory is called the drude lorentz uh, theory. And within this theory, we assume that the conduction electrons of our metal are completely free, except for the fact that there is a potential step at the surface of our metal that confines the electrons to the metal interior. Let me illustrate that uh, with this uh, schematic. So here is a schematic of our metal. So this is the interior of the metal where the potential which is plotted on the y-axis, uh, the potential is, uh, is, a, is a constant. At the surface of the metal the potential rises up, there is a step and that's the vacuum level. Right? And likewise uh, there is this other surface um, and that is the vacuum level corresponding to that surface and this is the potential step. Uh, at, at that uh, surface. So this is a this is a 1D metal. This is the uh, x-axis uh, spatial coordinate, and and of course, as I said, this is the uh, uh, the y-axis represents the, the the potential. So electrons inside this metal uh, are completely free to move around wherever they want, but they cannot uh, uh, escape uh, the metal because of this this barrier. If you are familiar with quantum mechanics, you can visualize this as a box, right? And um, you can have an electron in there, and uh, that electron can be treated as, treated as a particle in a box. Uh, but more about that later. Let me make another interesting observation here. This assumption of uh, a constant potential inside the metal and a potential step at the surface of the metal confining the electrons inside the metal is really equivalent uh, to the assumption of uh, positive charges due to the ions being completely smeared out inside the metal. So essentially you take the atoms without the valence or the conduction electrons, you have these ions which basically includes the nuclei and the core electrons, right? So these are the positively charged uh, ions that make up our metal. You take these uh, ions and smoosh them out, smear them out such that the positive charge uh, uh, due to all of the ions is uniformly distributed within the metal's interior. So our electrons are freely floating around in this background of a uniform positive charge. So we have uh, a free electron ideal gas within the con confines uh, of our metal. Amazingly, this oversimplified model, this classical model of uh, the electron, is able to explain a number of uh, uh, basic and important observations, such as the uh, DC and the AC electrical conductivity uh, of metals, the uh, Hall effect, uh, the thermal conductivity due to the electrons in metals near room temperature, etc. It's quite amazing. I should also mention though that uh, some important observations are uh, not explained by this simplified Rude model, which is not very surprising. Right? One of those important observations that uh, uh, the Drude model does not explain is the specific heat of solids uh, due to electrons. And this is something we will visit in today's lecture.
So this is one of the failures, one of the well-known failures of the uh, Druder model. Now, let me give you a preview of, uh, of, of that uh, uh, point that I just made. In a couple of lectures in the past, we talked about the specific heat of solids and uh, during that time, we focused only on the contribution to the specific heat due to lattice vibrations. We completely disregarded the contribution to the specific heat due to electrons. Electrons are uh, particles uh, within our uh, solid, especially in the case of metals, electrons are uh, free, at least according to the classical Ruder model. Um, surely electrons should contribute to the specific heat too. This is something we completely ignored. And you may have been puzzled about that at that time as to why we ignored the contribution to the specific heat due to electrons. The question is, do electrons really contribute to the specific heat and uh, if so, how much and uh, whether uh, the classical Ruder model can explain that. As we will find out that uh, uh, the, the, the Ruder model does not explain that. But more about that a little later. Now we are going to uh, go back to some of the uh, success stories behind the Ruder model. Right? Our first stop will be uh, Ohm's law. So we're going to try to explain that the simple uh, uh, Druder-Lorenz uh, theory, uh, classical theory of electrons, is actually able to explain um, um, Ohm's law. So we're going to derive Ohm's law and write down an expression for the uh, electrical uh, uh, conductivity, the DC electrical conductivity. That's that's our immediate goal. Okay, so we have written down Ohm's law, which is essentially the statement that the current I is directly proportional to an imposed voltage V and the proportionality constant is 1 over R, where R is the resistance of the metal. And uh, we can also state Ohm's law in a slightly different way in terms of the uh, current density and electric field instead of current and voltage, right? In, a, in order to do that, uh, we make some definitions. We have drawn a piece of our metal conductor on the right. Uh, it has a cross-sectional area A and a length L. And we go back to our uh, Ohm's law statement and multiply the left-hand side by uh, A and divide by A. And multiply and divide the right-hand side by L. Uh, the reason we are doing that is because I, uh, the current divided by A, the area, current per unit area, is nothing but the current density and uh, V divided by L is nothing but the electric field. So now we're, go we're going to just write down Ohm's law in terms of the uh, electric field and the current density. Okay, so there it is. J is our current density, E uh, is our electric field. We move things around and we get J equals uh, sigma times uh, E, where sigma is our DC electrical conductivity which is defined as uh, the length of our bar divided by the resistance times the cross-sectional area of the bar. The advantage of this equation is that the uh, conductivity sigma defined in this manner is purely a material property and is completely independent of the dimensions of our conductor. Now, we are going to use the Druder lorentz model of the classical electron to actually derive Ohm's law and we are actually in doing so we are going to write down an expression for the um, conductivity. So in the process of this derivation we are going to make a series of uh, important observations. The first one is the following. In the absence of an external electric field uh, there is obviously going to be no net current of electrons in any particular direction. However, the electrons will still be moving around, bouncing around randomly at very high speeds. It turns out that uh, the speed of, uh, 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 of our electrons is of the order of 10 to the 6 meters per second. We are going to call uh, our uh, random speed of our electrons as Vr, V subscript R. And uh, as I said, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, the, sp the speed is uh, quite high. We are stating 
that this is the speed without any proof at this time but uh, in the next lecture we are actually going to show that this is uh, a, a good number this is a typical speed we are going to actually explicitly show that but for now we are going to take this for granted our second observation is uh, the following when we apply an external electric field uh, on this uh, on this uh, piece of conductor uh, the electric field is going to impose a force on each of our electrons. Uh, the force is going to be uh, minus um, the charge of the electron E times the electric field capital E. So it's that's the force on each electron and uh, this force is going to make our electrons drift with a velocity Vd um, along a particular direction, along the direction of the field. So, we have a random speed which is uh, very high. In addition to that, uh, when we have a electric field imposed on our uh, electrons, classical electrons, there is going to be a drift velocity, Vd, which is of course going to be uh, much smaller than uh, the, the, this random, random speed. Okay, so we have a force minus E times capital E small e is the charge of the electron, capital E is the electric field that has been applied. And because of this force, our uh, electrons are going to be drifting uh, along a particular direction with the velocity Vd. Now this force that the electric field is imposing on our electron uh, at steady state is going to be balanced by uh, the friction or the drag forces due to collisions. So uh, remember our electrons are uh, uh, free particles bouncing around in our uh, metal um, and because they are going to encounter other electrons and ions and so forth, they are going to get scattered every so often. Right. So this scattering process is going to impose uh, some kind of a friction or a drag force on our electrons. So uh, that drag force has to be, will be balanced by the force applied due to the electric field. Let us think about what factors uh, control uh, that uh, drag force. So the drag force, I am arguing, is going to be given by the uh, mass of the electron times the drift velocity divided by a quantity uh, which I am representing as tau. This quantity tau is an important parameter. It's uh, it's uh, called the relaxation time. Uh, it is really the typical time between two collisions. Okay, so why do I uh, claim that uh, the uh, drag force due to collisions is given by m v d divided by tau? That's actually easy to understand. Let's say uh, an electron suffers a collision. Um, at that point, uh, uh, its velocity is actually uh, its drift velocity is going to be set to zero because it's been scattered and then from that point until the next point it suffers a collision uh, it has picked up a drift velocity Vd. So every time our electron suffers a collision uh, its average velocity along the direction of the field is uh, is uh, essentially set to zero. So it uh, the, the electric field attempts to accelerate the particle and, and creates a velocity Vd, the drift velocity, and the scattering event uh, sets it to zero. And uh, since the typical time between collisions is tau, the, uh, the acceleration, or I, I should say the deceleration, is uh, Vd divided by tau, and so the force due to the drag of uh, collisions is m times Vd divided by tau. So, as I said earlier, at steady state, the the force exerted by the electric field, which is minus E times capital E, should be equal to the force due to uh, uh, collisions, uh, the drag force due to collisions. Okay, so we are going to use this knowledge uh, to write down an expression for our current density. Okay, so let's take a look at the first part. We J is, of course, our current density, and we are saying that J equals this quantity minus n e v d n is the concentration of electrons and uh, e of course is the electronic charge and v d is our drift velocity 
and you can uh, intuitively understand that uh, minus n times e times vd is our net current density along a particular direction. Now, the equation in blue up top um, gives us an expression for vd in terms of the electric field, which we stick into our expression uh, for the current density and uh, that's that's essentially what we are doing over here right so this is the expression for vd that we got from this equation we stick that in here we uh, group terms and we get this expression believe it or not we have derived ohm's law this quantity that we have here plays the role of sigma the conductivity and of course, uh, the concentration of electrons uh, can be written in terms of the valency and the density and the Avogadro number uh, in this manner. So there it is. So a little introspection will uh, will tell us that uh, this is the correct value, for, uh, correct expression for the uh, concentration of electrons. We have our valency. Um, uh, that basically means that we have so many electrons available for conduction. We have the density, uh, our Gadro number, uh, atomic weight, and uh, and that basically gives us the uh, uh, concentration of uh, electrons, a number of electrons per unit volume, essentially. So we have, we really do have an expression for the conductivity sigma, right? So n, the concentration, is something. We know in terms of uh, 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 tabulated values, density, uh, valency, of a Gadro number, atomic weight. Uh, e is the um, uh, charge of an electron, we know that. Uh, uh, M is the mass of the electron, we also know that. Now, since we have this expression for the uh, conductivity, and the only unknown parameter is, uh, is tau, we can use measured values uh, of, uh, of the conductivity sigma for various metals uh, to compute the value of tau. And when we do that, we get a very interesting result. We find that the value of tau is of the order of 10 to the minus 14 seconds for a wide variety of metals. We thus seems to have, seem to have arrived at a unifying description of uh, metals in general, right? We have derived Ohm's law. We have a very nice closed form expression for the conductivity with one parameter tau that we do not know about. But we could compute that uh, using uh, uh, the measured values of sigma for a variety of metals. And when we do that, we get tau to be pretty much a constant around 10 to the minus 14 seconds for a variety of metals. All that seems uh, uh, very satisfying. Or does it? It turns out that there is a little bit of an issue here. And the problem is that because tau is of the order of 10 to the minus 14 seconds and remember earlier we assumed that the random velocity of our electrons is of the order of uh, 10 to the 6 meters per second which we will prove later. This basically means that the distance between collisions is of the order of uh, 100 angstrom. Now that, now, that is a very big number, a very big distance at the scale of the electron. It basically means that our electron is uh, moving uh, several tens of unit cells uh, before colliding with uh, another electron or, uh, or an ion. How is this possible? Right. So this is a puzzle which we actually will revisit later on. Right. We are going to end this lecture with, uh, uh, with one of the failings of the Druder theory. And that is that this uh, Druder-Lorenz model cannot explain the electronic contribution to the specific heat. So that's going to be our, our next topic. So remember that uh, heat capacity is the same thing as uh, the specific heat. So we are going to try to explore how uh, we expect our uh, conduction electrons uh, to contribute to the specific heat or the heat capacity. To do that, we are going to take recourse to the very familiar equipartition theorem. So here is our uh, result from the kinetic theory of gases or the equipartition theorem. We have 
We have discussed this before. The average kinetic energy of a free particle in 3D is going to be given by 3 halves kT. For one mole uh, of uh, such particles, uh, you need to multiply this result, the 3 halves kT result by the Avogadro number. And when you do that, you get uh, 3 halves RT, where, R, where uh, R is, of course, the universal gas constant under this context and not the resistance. And uh, in order to get the specific heat, uh, we f find the first derivative of the, this total energy E with respect to temperature and we get the result 3 half R. Where we have uh, tacked on the uh, subscript E under C to indicate that this is the electronic contribution to the specific heat. Now, if this is the electronic contribution to the specific heat, what is the total value of the specific heat of a metal? So the total specific heat or the total heat capacity of a metal is going to be given by uh, the contribution due to the lattice vibrations which we had already established to be 3R remember and the contribution due to the electrons. So here is the expression for the total heat capacity of a metal. Uh, so the total heat capacity or the total specific heat C is going to be equal to CPH which represents the vibration, the lattice uh, contribution or the phonon contribution to the specific heat which we know is 3R as I just mentioned and uh, to that we need to add the electronic contribution which really should be uh, 3 half R times the number of valence electrons. Right? For simplicity let us just assume that the valence electron, uh, uh, number of valence electrons equals 1. In which case we get 3R plus 3 halves R as the total, total heat capacity of a metal, which is 9 half R. The question is, what is the observed value of the specific heat of a metal? But the rather interesting situation is that experiments indicate that the value of the specific heat of metals at high temperatures is 3R. Meaning that the specific heat even at very high temperatures is just simply dominated by the uh, uh, lattice or the phonon contributions uh, to the specific heat and the electronic contribution, it is as though the electronic contribution to the specific heat is uh, zero or negligible. In fact, Accurate experiments indicate that the electronic contribution to the specific heat is one hundredth of the value that we expect, one hundredth of three half R. So how is this possible? How come the electrons are barely contributing to the specific heat of our uh, metal? Um, so here is uh, so here is an example of uh, um, the, the the failing of the simple classical drude lorentz uh, model. In order to understand what is going on with these electrons, why they are contributing so little uh, to the specific heat, uh, we need to introduce uh, another quantum mechanical concept. We need to uh, introduce this concept called the Pauli's exclusion principle. Remember when we attempted to explain the uh, specific heat of uh, insulators, the lattice or the phonon contribution to the specific heat of insulators, we needed to introduce a, a quantum mechanical concept. Uh, actually, Einstein introduced the quantum mechanical quant concept, which was later improved upon by Debye. Uh, now, we are encountering a similar puzzling situation and that applies to the electronic contribution of the specific heat and one, once again we have to take recourse to quantum mechanics and, uh, and we need to introduce the Pauli exclusion principle which essentially states that not more than two electrons can have the same energy level. Uh, so this will be the subject of our uh, next lecture, the next session uh, when we explore this topic further. Thank you.